Eric Beard back again talking about integrated training and the National Academy of Sports Medicine approach to that. So far we've done a brief review of NASM's OPT model, their three-leveled approach, and we've talked about the seven components of a workout. The last video we discussed the warm-up where we would adjust flexibility and cardiorespiratory training. Now let's talk at least about core training and balance training and maybe reactor training depending on the time that we have here today. So the core is the center of the body. It's everything but the arms and the legs. And the musculature within the core can be divided into the stabilization group and the, and the strength group. Or the deep intrinsic core stabilizers and the movement system. Or the stabilization system and the movement system. You, you hear different monikers for these groups. Traditionally, because we're in a seated or chair-borne society, the deep intrinsic stabilizers are weak, they're inhibited, they have a, a low functional capacity. So we're going to invest most of our times into stimulating those tissues, those muscles, developing endurance and strength within them. We do this by exercises that will hold our spine still and we want to hold these poses or do multiple repetitions of these movements, such as a floor bridge, prone iso abs, quadruped, opposite arm and leg raise, the list goes on. The key little to no movement of the spine. Enhance the functional capacity of the deep core stabilizers. This way we can keep our discs healthy, in, uh, decrease wear and tear in ligaments, as well as make sure that we have appropriate force transmission from the lower extremity up through the upper extremity. Every time that we're running, that foot hits the ground, Energy and force has to come up through our legs, up through our core, up through our upper extremity. And if we're throwing a ball, most of that force is generated from the big toe up through the body all the way up through the arm. And if we don't have the ability to reduce, produce, or stabilize force in our core, our midsection, we end up overworking muscles around the elbow, hips, shoulders, and knees. It leads to overuse injuries elsewhere through the body and perhaps even locally with the rate of low back pain. We know 80 to 85 percent of individuals in the United States of America will go ahead and experience. Uh, as you know, probably the number two cause for visits to a physician is going to be low back pain. The good news is it's 50% of low back pain and it goes away on its own. The bad news is it's 50% of low back pain is reoccurring. So by investing into the stabilization type of training, we can enhance the health of our core. Within the strength level of the OPT model, for core training, we now focus on the movement system flexion, extension, rotation, lateral flexion. We're working with the larger muscle fibers that will actually move our trunk. We have to be able to condition the movement system muscles uh, like rectus abdominis, external oblique, quadratus lumborum to prepare ourselves to deal with heavier loads. And once we've developed stabilization, developing that transverse abdominis, the lumbar multifidi, the diaphragm, the internal oblique, and the stabilization level, address the core stabilizers and the strength level by moving the spine, we now go into the power level. Then that's really just movement with speed. It's functionally applicable speed. So if I'm dealing with a golf or, or I'm dealing with a baseball player, it's going to have explosive movements that we're going to have to develop. If I'm dealing with a recreational athlete or just someone who's a fit individual, I'll get them to move fast, but it won't be quite as explosive because life does happen with speed. When you have to throw a snowball, the dog pulls you while you're walking, you have to be, de be able to decelerate that movement and pull back in the other direction. We just want to make sure that we're starting someone off with a heavy dose of stabilization, moving to strength and power. Now, these levels of the OPT model typically correspond throughout the rest of the components. Balance training follows a very similar progression. In the stabilization level of balance training, there's little to no movement of our stance leg or our hip, knee, and ankle. We're working on the stabilizers around the hip, knee, and ankle since most people tend to overpronate and have weakness of the glutes and the lumbar pelvic hip complex. We're working with the ability of the hips to work with the proprioceptors in the foot. All that cumulative neural input that's coming in into the foot and that's going to condition the appropriate response up through the rest of the kinetic chain. Most of the balance training is done on one foot, although balance training could be two feet on a proprioceptive modality, something that's wobbly. It could be done seated on perhaps a dynadisc or a half kneeling position. But one foot or single leg balance training is most common. Stabilization level, little to no movement in that stance leg, move an arm or a leg, increase the perturbation. So our body has to respond with these, these um, activation patterns to stabilize the joints. Once we've developed significant stability around that hip, knee, and ankle, we can now move to strength level. Strength level gives us functionally applicable movement, squatting up and down on a single leg, much like getting in and out of a car or going up and down a, f a flight of stairs. We can do step-ups, we can do lunges, 
We're maintaining stability and alignment, but we're now working on the prime movers of the hip, knee, and ankle. Once we get up to the power level of balance training, this is typically thought of as more for an athlete, but like we've been saying, this can be for someone who's a fit individual as well. We have to develop high levels of eccentric strength. We're going to be using one leg. We're going we're gonna to go from one leg in the air and land on the other leg. This is oftentimes thought of as a hop. When you go from one leg to the same leg, it's a hop, or one leg to the other leg, it's a bound. Regardless, you're going to land on one foot and you're going to nail that landing in a controlled balance position and hold that for three to five seconds. It's going to give us high levels of eccentric strength to be able to absorb that force in our kinetic chain. It's particularly stored in the muscles, muscular system. We don't want that force to be dissipated as heat through our ligaments and through our bones and our discs and our cartilage. So we want to make sure that we have a significant base of stability, strengthen the prime movers before jumping and landing in a single leg much like we would in the, in the power level of balance training. So core training and balance training, core training center of the body, balance training, hip, knee, and ankle, they pair very well together to prepare us for functional activities. Since we're doing well on time here, let's talk about reactive training. Reactive training is just landing, it's a quick powerful movement. It's a, an eccentric muscular action where the muscle is lengthened followed by rapid concentric action. We're working with the elastic properties of the tissue. Whether we're walking, running, jumping, swinging, we have to contract and relax the tissues in a controlled process while we keep alignment of our five kinetic chain checkpoints. Good technique, good form here is important. We're not landing on the heel, we're not landing on the toe, we're landing behind the ball of the foot, that reactive portion of the foot. In the stabilization level of reactive training, we focus on learning how to land. Most important thing, we land in a controlled balance position, hold that for three to five seconds. We're typically dealing with just jumps here from two feet to two feet. Once we've developed a good stabilization base, we move on to strength, which are repeated and rhythmic movements. We will focus on multiplanar movements, still going two legs to two legs. The power level is explosive, it's AFAP, it's true plyometric movements, contract and relax that tissue as fast as possible. This is Higher level, higher risk, but when we're dealing with athletes, the stop and change direction and explosive nature is really what we have to prepare them for. Core balance and reactive training really fit well together. They're more like stabilization training as a group. They're preparing the kinetic chain, all aspects of it, to deal in a multiplanar environment, to transmit force from head to toe and toe all the way back down to hand. Toe all the way back down to hand, hand, hand all the way back down to toe, and then toe all the way up through hand. It's got to pass through the center of our body, pass through the hip, knee, and ankle, and the core, and we've got to be able to do it multiple speeds and multiple changes of direction in multiple planes. So we want to make sure that we're progressing, progressively bringing someone through these types of training. We're matching them up to their assessment and their health history and their goals, and we're matching this to the rest of their OPT program. Next up, we'll discuss speed, agility, and quickness, as well as resistance training.